So atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disorder. It occurs over time in most people. So in part, it's an age-related phenomenon. Just as the body changes on the outside, hair goes gray, skin's not quite as soft as it used to be. Some people, as we get older, get shorter. Um, similar changes, age-related changes, are happening on the inside of the body, including in the tissue architecture of the heart. Those changes are what um, promote a tendency for the normal electrical rhythm to change into one that is a little bit slower, a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more irregular, that uh, over time can precipitate a first episode of, of atrial fibrillation. When that occurs, the normal functioning of the heart is changed. Normally the way the heart functions is that the upper chambers relieve, receive the electrical impulse uh, that then travels, that causes the heart upper chambers to beat. The impulse, electrical impulse travels down to the lower chambers of the heart and then the lower chambers beat. So there's this notion that we have in our mind of the sound of the heart beating, right? Ba-bump, ba-bump, ba-bump. And that's analogous to the upper chambers followed by the lower chambers beating. Ba-bump, ba-bump, ba-bump. Well, when people convert or when their rhythm changes to atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers stop squeezing in an organized manner. In fact, the upper chambers are actually seeing a chaotic electrical rhythm that no longer permits a organized contraction of all of the fibers in the upper chambers. And so instead, it's just chaotic and they're quivering. They're just quivering, okay? And that quivering is related to electrical impulses traveling throughout the upper chambers, throughout the atria, at three to 500 times per minute. Well, the mechanical contraction can't keep up, and so it simply quivers. And it's been described, if you were holding a heart that was in atrial fibrillation, described as sort of what you might think a bag of worms might feel like. And that's actually what the term fibrillation is, is, is meant to represent. At the same time, those three to 500 impulses traveling throughout the atrium are finding their way down to the lower chambers and also conducting quite quickly. And so the upper chambers are quivering and no longer contracting, no longer squeezing blood into the lower chambers as they were before. So related to a, an engine, a four cylinder engine is now down to two, two cylinders. Okay. At the same time, the lower chambers, which normally have an adequate period of time to fill and then contract, fill and contract, are now beating so quickly that they hardly have time to fill and they hardly have time to squeeze blood out. So for two different reasons, no mechanical contribution to circulation from the upper chambers, followed by inadequate time to fill and contract from the lower chambers, atrial fibrillation leads to a significant reduction in cardiac output, or said another way, in the amount of blood that is circulated uh, to the body. And this creates a variety of problems some people are not aware of, and some people feel. Many people don't even recognize that they've gone into AFib for a variety of reasons. As uh, We think that as we get older, our body's ability to sense and detect changes uh, um, diminishes. And quite a number of people don't even feel their AFib. But for the people who do, it's initially, perhaps most commonly, a sense of a rapid, uh, a rapid irregular heartbeat. That rapid irregular heartbeat, um, which prevents adequate circulation, also contributes to a sense of not being able to breathe properly. Um, we call that dyspnea. It can be at rest, or it could be only when you're doing things, or dyspnea on exertion. And uh, in addition to that, not being able to breathe, the heart's beating irregularly, it can create a lot of anxiety and dizziness. And often there can be chest pain or discomfort or a sense of uneasiness internally. These are the most common symptoms, but there are a variety of, of manifestations uh, that all come from this, this uh, reduction in the cardiac output and the circulation because the purpose of circulating blood 
is to deliver oxygen to the rest of the body, including to the brain. And so when people go into AFib, their brain's not getting as much oxygen, they can get dizzy, their vision can get blurred, they can even faint from it. You know. uh, so quite a number of symptoms that people can experience. So atrial fibrillation is initially detected by auscultation. Auscultation is the medical term for listening to somebody's heart. So when a provider is listening to a patient's heart, the first thing that they may detect is the irregularity in the heart rhythm. The second thing that they may detect is the absence of certain heart sounds. The two together would then trigger the provider uh, to recognize that there is likely a change in the heart rhythm and the simplest way to detect that, recognizing that the heart rhythm is an electrical phenomenon, is to record that electrical phenomenon on a piece of paper, which we call an electrocardiograph or electrocardiogram. The name of the machine that records it is called the electrocardiograph. So there are a variety uh, of descriptions of AFib, uh, and there are different so-called types of AFib. From a uh, patient perspective, they may have AFib that only occurs periodically, briefly. Or they may have AFib that is more, more long-term and continuous and, uh, and never reverts back to normal unless the doctors or the providers use either medicines or other treatments to convert their rhythm uh, back to normal. Um, the, the type of AFib that comes and goes on its own, we call that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Paroxysms meaning, you know, period, periodic episodes. And the type of AFib that seems to be there continuously is called persistent atrial fibrillation or persistent AFib. Neither of them require the patient to feel it. So this is simply a description of what the electrical system is doing. Is, it, is the heart in AFib all the time, persistent AFib? Or is the heart in AFib you know, on and off on its own, paroxysmal AFib, irrespective of whether the patient feels it or not? Patients can do a number of things to reduce the likelihood of um, staying in AFib or developing AFib. Once somebody's in atrial fibrillation, there are a couple of maneuvers, we call them Valsalva maneuvers, that can in some people revert their rhythm back to normal. Analogous to taking a, a half a breath in and then pushing down, um, some people uh, drink a, a glass of ice cold water, um, sort of holding your breath a little bit, a variety of things. Sometimes they'll work um, sometimes they do not. Often, if a patient goes to the hospital in the emergency room, whether it's for atrial fibrillation or even for other arrhythmias, sometimes we push um, somewhat forcefully on the neck right near the carotid artery, um, not to block the artery certainly, but there's a, an area there called the carotid bulb or the, that has um, nerve endings in it that when you rub them, um, they will uh, stimulate the heart in a way that can actually convert the rhythm back to normal. There are a variety of risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation. The most common are um, high blood pressure, um, obesity, uh, sleep apnea, um, having other forms of heart disease, whether it's coronary disease, diabetes. Um, so addressing these medical conditions or even uh, if, if somebody has them with blood pressure control, weight loss, um, good glucose control, addressing sleep apnea, again, with weight loss or with CPAP treatment, addressing those risk factors helps stave off um, um, developing atrial fibrillation and also helps uh, prevent recurrences of AFib and prevents progression in some people who start out as AFib that comes and goes, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, over time it then can progress to AFib that no longer converts back to normal on its own and actually is there all the time. Some people go through that progression of just some firing, 
then sh a first episode of AFib that is self-terminating, and then multiple short episodes of atrial fibrillation, true paroxysmal AFib, and then eventually persistence. Some people don't progress, we don't know why, and so, irrespective of risk factor management, and some people just start out as persistent atrial fibrillation. So while we recognize the differences, we don't have enough information today to tell us about who's gonna progress and who's not, but what we do know is irrespective of the type of atrial fibrillation, addressing risk factors does help slow progression and prevent development of subsequent episodes. Yeah, typically, um, while there are medications that um, can be stimulants to the body in general, and, and through that can trigger a variety of arrhythmias, um, such as uh, diet supplements, uh, such as um, Adderall or, or ADD. Um, again, some of this is anecdotal, not necessarily that there's a clear cause and effect. Um, but medications that are stimulants, whether people are taking them oral medicines on a daily basis, or even medicines that are used in an intensive care unit where they're intravenous stimulants that are used to maintain blood pressure for people who are sick or to uh, make the heartbeat stronger um, in, a, you know, in a variety of settings. These stimulant uh, medicines can, uh, in some people, trigger a variety of arrhythmias. Uh, and, and one of those arrhythmias can certainly be atrial fibrillation. Yeah, atrial fibrillation is a very uh, interesting arrhythmia in that its triggering is often, although not always, related to a fluctuation in the hormones that we have uh, uh, throughout the day. We, we call it the diurnal variation of our hormones. Uh, which just means that through the course of a day, various hormones are elevated and then decrease and, and change throughout the day. The uh, most relevant example of that is that during the daytime, when the body is active and we are awake and we are stimulated by our surroundings, there are higher levels of adrenaline or adrenergic hormones that are active in our body and there are lower levels of parasympathetic or vagal hormones. When we go to sleep, that relationship changes. The adrenergic hormones withdraw, and the vagal hormones, the sympathetic hormones, which are in part related to the healing of the body and recovery, um, can um, stimulate the, uh, the area of the heart muscle right at the insertion of those veins and actually trigger firing from the pulmonary veins. It's unclear whether it's purely enhanced vagal tone or whether there is a relationship to changes in adrenaline at the same time. It's most likely a, a complex uh, mixture, a complex relationship between adrenergic stimulation as well as enhanced vagal tone that together can trigger AFib. And, and, and nighttime is when, is when that unique combination of hormones can be found most commonly. So many people describe atrial fibrillation that wakes them up in the middle of the night and is triggered at night. Highly relevant and, and sort of warning signs of potentially severe manifestations of atrial fibrillation that absolutely warrant emergency room evaluation are stroke symptoms. If somebody loses function in a part of their body, it could be movement, it could be sudden loss of sensation, it could be vision, ability to speak, um, sensation at the tip of your tongue, something seemingly minor, for somebody who's got AFib, that's a, that's a warning sign that there could be a stroke in evolution and important to, to be evaluated by medical professionals immediately um, that have the capacity to, to diagnose the stroke and immediately treat it. Secondly, um, chest pain. Atrial fibrillation can be the first manifestation of coronary disease, blockages in the arteries, atherosclerotic heart disease and those blockages can be severe. 
um, atrial fibrillation, because it makes the heart beat so fast, it can place an excessive demand on the heart that the blood flow through the arteries to the heart can no longer keep up with, which then results in uh, limitation of the amount of blood that's actually um, not being pumped by the heart, but actually being fed to the heart to oxygenate, to, to nourish the heart. And that type of reduction is what can cause heart attacks. So severe chest pain is, is a, a very important warning sign that needs to be recognized and addressed in, in an emergency situation. And the third uh, most relevant uh, symptom that warrants immediate attention is severe shortness of breath. That shortness of breath can be, again, related to the rapidity of the heart beating, not only compromising blood flow, but now with the blood not being pumped and circulated properly, that the lungs are not able to receive, and ex receive blood and, and then move blood to the heart, which means the gas exchange, the oxygen exchange, and the CO2 elimination and then the picking up the new oxygen gets compromised. And, uh, so, and these are some of the manifestations of congestive heart failure. Atrial fibrillation can um, cause a variety of, of uh, I would say, statistical, statistical uh, changes on morbidity and mortality. Most relevant is that atrial fibrillation is associated with a five-fold increased risk of having a stroke. Secondly, it's associated with, an, uh, with a pro about a two-fold increase risk of developing congestive heart failure. Atrial fibrillation is a manifestation of a variety of other heart conditions that together, whether it's high blood pressure, sleep apnea, other um, uh, coronary disease, uh, heart failure, uh, of course having a stroke, that cumulatively can then lead to uh, a reduction in longevity and so can impact mortality as well. For somebody who's diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, the most important first assessment is what their risk of having a stroke is. There are a variety of medical, uh, or, or I would say, uh, characteristics of patients that uh, when taken together can give us a reasonable prediction on whether somebody is more or less likely to have a stroke. And for people who are more likely to have a stroke, the treatment is starting blood thinners. The reason why is because when the upper chambers are no longer squeezing and contracting but actually quivering, you can imagine that the blood just pools up in the upper chambers and in fact can stagnate in certain areas, okay? And, and of all of the areas related to the heart, the, there is an, there's an outpouching off of the left atrium called the appendix or the appendage, the left atrial appendage, almost analogous to your, your appendix that we all have. And when the blood stagnates in that area, just like blood that stagnates anywhere else, it'll clot. So clotted blood is never good inside the heart because if it ever leaves the heart and travels through the blood vessels, that clot can block off a blood vessel in the brain and cause a stroke. It can be circulated back to one of the coronary arteries, one of the arteries that supplies blood to the heart and, and block that artery and cause a heart attack. Same thing can happen if that blood clot travels down the arm, uh, uh, gets lodged in a, in a uh, small blood vessel that that feeds the gut, the gut can get infarcted, or it can cause um, reduction or elimination of blood flow to the legs, and, and anything beyond that point now starts to die off. Um, so preventing blood clot formation is absolutely paramount to the initial uh, treatment of people who are felt to be at higher risk for having a stroke. And the way we um, address that is by using blood thinners, medicines that will prevent the formation of blood clot. They don't, in fact, dissolve the blood clot, but what they do is they allow the body's own mechanisms to then dissolve the blood clot, while the blood thinners prevent more clot from forming. So there are a variety of um, approaches, medical therapy, procedural therapies, 
medical therapy nowadays is relegated to a small minority of people who wouldn't either tolerate other procedures or who truly are doing well, they're not developing complications, uh, and or have simply decided that they don't want to pursue anything else. But uh, the vast majority of, of cardiologists and arrhythmia specialists um, are proponents of the idea that that when somebody develops atrial fibrillation, they are better served by getting them back to their God-given normal rhythm as soon as possible. There are some people who have had it for years and years, and the likelihood of being able to restore sinus rhythm for any meaningful period of time is very low. And so what we've also realized is that the electrical manifestation of atrial fibrillation leads to neurohormonal changes or changes in the way the whole body works that accelerate sort of the changes in the heart that led to AFib in the first place. And so once you've got AFib, you're more likely to then maintain AFib. And so there's a famous expression, AFib begets AFib. And the more AFib we allow somebody to have, the harder it is to get them to stay in normal rhythm. So if we can capitalize on the opportunity to intervene when somebody is experiencing their first episodes of atrial fibrillation, they have a much greater likelihood of staying in normal rhythm and avoiding complications such as stroke, avoiding complications such as heart failure, avoiding um, complications of the treatments such as bleeding from blood thinners, fatigue from beta blockers and, and, and slow heart rate from diltiazem and a variety of other treatments, the side effects of medical therapy, as well as avoiding the potential complications, heart failure um, that can develop. Not to mention, as we all get older, we can develop other medical problems that then make it more challenging to be treated for AFib, such as bleeding from the gut. We call that a GI bleed, whether it's diverticulosis or hemorrhoids, it doesn't matter. But when somebody develops that problem, they can no longer safely be treated with a blood thinner for atrial fibrillation. And if that person's had AFib for 10 years and now they have a, a bleed that's hard to control, you have to stop the blood thinner, which then places that person at risk for having a stroke. So if we can eliminate um, the interaction between atrial fibrillation and other medical conditions, the better for the patient. Hence, we try to put people, in, in most cases, back to normal rhythm as soon as possible. So there are a variety of ways that we can get people back to normal rhythm. One way is through cardioversion. Cardioversion um, is a, a combination of words. It's, it's an electrical conversion of your rhythm from a not normal rhythm back to normal rhythm. And of course, that normal rhythm resides within your heart, cardio. So all of that's been condensed into cardioversion. Cardioversion is a simple procedure. It's done under sedation. Patient is put to sleep for a few minutes. Uh, pads are placed, electrical pads are placed on, placed on the chest, sometimes on the side, sometimes on the back of the patient. Energy is delivered in a synchronized manner that stops the heart's electrical activity and allows the normal rhythm to take over immediately. And the procedure is over. That's cardioversion. It's not curative, and somebody can easily go back into AFib immediately or they can maintain normal rhythm for the rest of their lives. Hard to predict. Um, people who have already failed cardioversion, we don't typically continue to just try it over and over again. We need to do something differently to increase their chances of staying in normal rhythm with cardioversion. Sometimes that's using a drug to improve the chances of staying in rhythm, but some people may not be able to tolerate a drug. Some people may simply say, I don't want to take more drugs. I want to do something that's more definitive, and that more definitive treatment today is called cardiac ablation. In my medical practice, I like to leverage uh, digital technologies, digital health. So I embrace the devices that are already in the market, uh, whether it's a, it's a watch or a band or a handheld ECG device that gives patients the, the ability to um, recognize a symptom, do something about it, record a rhythm, and then communicate to me without them having to undergo an invasive procedure. That early warning or that screening process 
allows us to identify problems far earlier. And that's better for patients. Um, and then that helps me give those patients the best options because we are diagnosing and potentially intervening far earlier than without those technologies. And the outcomes are always better when you can intervene early, no matter what the condition is.